Hello. So who here is excited about Grid, CSS Grid? Having seen it, a bit of it from Rachel. I have been thinking a lot about what we're going to be doing with those design, with, those, with that technology once we have it, with the technology, Grid, Flexbox, all the other things that have come along. Uh, it's going to be much easier to code layouts, the same old layouts that everybody's been designing. But it's also going to be very easy to do completely different layouts in a way that's been tough for a while. So what kinds of designs do we want to do? This has brought me to an obsession with uh, graphic design history and art direction. Uh, but I have to say, I, for the longest time, didn't really know what art direction is. I thought I knew what art direction is. I mean, art direction's the job that that guy does, right? Goes to meetings, directs the art, <laughs> makes sure everything stays on brand, right? Like, uh, OK. Um, and then I was working on this project with some really great people, and I had this sort of breakthrough, this epiphany about what art direction really is about, that it's about having a conversation with the audience. It's about in intentionally deciding what that conversation should be, and then using the visual design to have that conversation. So here, I just gave you four slides, right? There were types of Helvetica. Why? Because uh, it's about graphic design, and you're supposed to always use Helvetica when you're talking about graphic design, right? Like, I just put a light bulb. That's goofy. Why would I put a, because I had an idea. Like, uh, I made the slide yellow to match my light bulb. Like, that's silly. So, but meanwhile, while you were looking at those slides, you had a reaction to it, whether it was conscious or subconscious. And I was starting to give you a feeling about what this talk is going to be like by using, making those choices. I don't like Helvetica very much. I don't like that design style very much. This is much more up my alley. I'll stop on the street and you know, just randomly take pictures like this because I find this so beautiful. So how should I typeset this deck? Uh, maybe I'll take this of the default, uh, the keynote templates, right? Because it kind of matches my personal aesthetic a bit more. But what does that say about what I'm going to tell you today? This is really sort of weak and whispery, and it's not, it's, it's not an arts and crafts presentation. Like what, I would be giving you the wrong association. So this is much better choice. This has the kind of association with the things that I want to talk about today. Um, and that process of thinking through, well, what associations do I want to make? You're not choosing a typeface that never existed before. You're not going to lay something out in a dimension that has never been accessible. Everything we're doing is tapping into things that have been seen before, and it's creating an association with other, other work, other people, other things that people have seen. Um, Editorial design is another really great way to think about this. There's this book that I really like called Editorial Design where they said in it, the vast majority of editorial has at its heart the idea of communicating an idea of a story through the organization and presentation of words and visuals. The idea of communicating the idea of the story. So you have to first identify what's the idea of the story, what's the idea of this site, what's the idea of this app and then find ways to communicate that. And you might think, well, I'm not doing editorial. I'm special. I'm making an app. Apps are different. Websites suck. Apps are better. Uh, so none of this applies to me. No, actually, in these two computer programs, as we used to call them, uh, they have very little content on the page. There's very little here, but they're very different by the choices they make between the layout and the color and the typography. The one on the left, Google Docs, kind of gives you this feeling of, I'm sturdy, I'm here for you, I'm going to stick around, where the one on the right sort of gives you this feeling of, hello, important writer. We're going to quiet everything, and you can have a chance to really focus and write. Very different feelings from those choices. The idea of communicating an idea of a story. So in this book, there's an example. I like this. This is a magazine layout. I haven't actually read this article, but I can see there it says China, speed, building the future. There's these photographs of architecture. So this seems like a story about architecture in China and the amazing things that are happening and the feeling in the photos and then the feeling with the layout and the way the text kind of stands up like buildings and the space between the photos and the text also making lines. All of that sort of gives you this feeling of like, yeah, something awesome is going on here. And then look at the website. <laughs> the website doesn't give you that, that feeling at all. The website kind of gives you a feeling of clutter and chaos. Uh, I can't even tell or guess what this would be about. Why is that happening? I think it's happening because for the longest time we were stuck in a rut of assuming that every website is supposed to be laid out like this. 
Or more recently, like this. We are unique, find out how unique. This is the part where you uh, talk about how unique you are as a, a business, but your website is exactly the same, right? Or this tweet, John Gold, which of these two possible websites are you currently designing? <laughs> Somehow layout became this multiple choice question that we all just keep choosing one of the layouts that's on the shelf out of the six that we're supposed to be using. And we're totally bored. We're bored, our audiences are bored, everybody's bored. There's a lot of power that you could use and leverage by using our direction, by using unique layouts that is just waiting. It's sitting there waiting for you to snatch up that power. There's an amazing future coming. Here's the official timeline. Uh, we start with the no layout layout, then we switch to table-based layouts, we switch to hand-coded float-based layouts when we switch to floats, and we get these framework layouts. We're sort of obsessed with frameworks right now. That's the, that's the era we're in. But I, I think frameworks are about to go away in a big way. And then we're gonna have a unikitten flying around bringing us the amazing future. I'm gonna show you some examples. They are all right now at labs.jensimmons.com. There's also some links up on the top of that page that go to some videos that I'll talk about later. Um, I just wanna show you a few properties that are uh, pretty exciting that are not CSS grid, but also contribute to what you can do with layout and contribute to what you can do with art direction. One of them is initial letter. How many people have heard of initial letter? Uh, quite a few of you. How many people have used initial letter? Oh, like seven, okay. Um, so in graphic design, one of the things that we do is uh, have big caps either sticking up or dropping down. Uh, it helps guide the eye of the reader. It also means that you don't have to put the very beginning of the text at the very top of the page, right? In this design, actually, the very top left is a photo, and the headline is over on the right, and the text starts way down towards the bottom. But people don't get confused. They have no problem figuring out where to put their eye because there's a giant drive cap, and it shows them exactly where to start reading. Um, we try to do drop caps on the web. They don't work very well by just isolating the first letter using a pseudo element and then making it bigger by using text font sizing because uh, it's always a little different in every browser and you end up with this inconsistencies where things don't really line up. I like the one on the right because they, they were just like, yeah, it, it's not gonna line up ever, so we're just gonna make a big space and call it art, <laughs> right? But initial letter is gonna let you line things up perfectly. Um, here in this example, I've got an initial letter four, that last line of code, and it makes the letter the height of four lines of text. Then if the font doesn't download, if the user enlarges the text, if somebody else comes along and changes the CSS and they adjust the line height, it doesn't matter. The computer, computers are really good at math. Get the computer to do the math of figuring out how big the letter should be, right? Very simple property to use. But what's gonna happen in browsers where uh, they don't understand initial letter, right? If you use the principles of progressive enhancement, you use the kinds of things, the, the, the way of working that Jeremy was talking about yesterday, um, what happens when a browser doesn't understand CSS? It just skips those lines. I like to think of it as it, of it, you know, like crossing them out, right? So cross out those two lines, deactivate them, and what do you get? Oh, you get that. That's not good. I don't wanna have this little tiny orange letter with an awkward margin on it. Those other properties need to never be applied unless I'm using initial letter. So how, what are we gonna do about that? This is what we can do about it. We can use a feature query, an at support statement. It's a conditional, so that I say at support initial letter. In this case, I use an or, and I also say at support initial letter WebKit because um, I'm using the prefix. And uh, you can see that all, all the code that's inside this support statement is only gonna run if those conditions are true. If the conditions are false, it's gonna skip the whole statement and if the browser, i.e., doesn't understand at supports, it also skips the entire block. It doesn't throw an error, it doesn't stop rendering the page, you can count on the browser to gracefully degrade, and so you can go ahead and uh, use this code today, even though the only browser that, that supports uh, initial letter is Safari 9 and 10. Um, it will just look like this. You'll have in the top picture, you get, in most browsers, you get the experience on the top, and then the browser, uh, in Safari 9 and 10, you get the experience towards the bottom. By the way, we're putting this right now into Firefox, and it's Jeremy Chen, who's here from Taipei. He's the engineer working on it, so yay. It's good. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. He was showing me yesterday, it's like half-baked right now. He's showing it to me yesterday, it's awesome. Um, but feature queries, huge tool that people should start considering using, start using. 
This is what it looks like. Support, at supports property and value, you put a bunch of CSS. And I think that this is going to be really important as we start to use Grid because it's going to let us put a layout for older browsers who don't understand Grid, and then inside a supports display Grid, we're going to be able to start writing code for Grid and using other things like margins and padding and color and text size and whatever we might want to combine that Grid layout with in order to have an amazing layout for Grid. And we don't have to wait until every browser that every user we have has Grid. Because honestly, what's that? It's going to take like eight years before every single solitary user updates their browser. Um, very quickly, I think within one year, you'll have like, you know, 60%, 80% maybe of users who have Grid. You're still going to care about the other 20% or the other 10% or 5%. So this is, I think, what is going to get us there. I've written quite a long article at the Hacks blog about how to use feature queries, showing you exactly how to use them, even though they're not supported in every browser. So check, check that out. Um, viewport units is another technology that is pretty exciting. In this example, the header, which has this photo in the background, is always 100% of the height of the browser window. No matter how big the device is or how big the browser window is, how does that happen? It's happening because I, I'm using the header element and I'm putting a height of 100 VH on that header element. I'm telling it to always be 100% of the viewport height. There's no JavaScript on this example. So no matter what goes on, it's going to fit. It's going to be responsive. Viewport units, any place that you might use an M, a rem, a percent, or a pixel, any sort of measurement, whether you're sizing type or you're measuring as the size of something, you can use a viewport unit. VHVW, viewport height and width, or view min and max, which are like the, it evaluates to see which one's smaller and which one's bigger, and it picks either the bigger or the smaller one. We can do some very interesting things with this. You know, have you ever been in a meeting or your designers have been in a meeting or content people have been in a meeting where everybody wants their stuff above the fold? And we've been trying to tell everybody there is no fold. Stop talking about the fold. We can't control the f Yeah, you know what? Actually, we can now control the fold. <laughs> Uh, but what it means is we can size things. And of course, you've got to realize that sometimes the screen is really, really small. So you need to work responsibly and figure out what that means. But especially if you're doing something that has a lot of white space or you have some sort of data visualization, you have some sort of object kind of thing going on, if you'd like to size or morph or constrain that into the space that's actually within the viewport at any given moment, you can do that now. Object fit is really interesting. So images, right? It used to be we just put an image on a web page, we sized it to the size that we wanted, and we went on with life back when the days were simple. Now we uh, make our images much bigger than they need to be, and then we use CSS to resize them, and we use with 100%, or in this case, I think it's with 50%, to uh, make the image grow with the space that's available. That's awesome, responsive images responsive web design using images, uh, then the height automatically grows at the same time. Well, maybe you don't want that. Maybe you really want the height to be the same. Well, what can you do about that? So here, I, I did that. I capped the height, and then, oh, look, I'm squishing Grace Hopper's face. That's not, I don't want that. I would like to be able to specify the size of the image in two dimensions at the same time and not squish the aspect ratio of the photo. Guess what? There's a new property. It's called object fit. And using object fit cover, cover as the value, you can accomplish this, where it's going to slide the image and crop it. And you can actually, this is cropping based on the center point. You can move that point around a lot. Like, we've been able to do this with background for quite a while. But now you can start doing it with content images. Um, so here I've got, uh, there's the code for it, width 50%, height 400 pic uh, pixels tall, object fit cover. Um, and it means that we can start to use, when we start to use some of these other layout mechanisms, like Flexbox and Grid, and you start to want to set things to be a certain size vertically, which we haven't been doing, you've got some more tools to be able to do stuff with that. Then the big, big things that are happening, multi-column Flexbox and Grid, right? These are the three big or the two big Flexbox and Grid um, that are uh, really exciting and coming up. I'm just going to talk about CSS Grid today because time is so short. Um, Rachel was telling you all about it. Here we go. You know, you've got the ability to do a layout in two dimensions and have the bottom row, in this case, unlike Flexbox, put the items underneath the columns of the other things. We're used to thinking about the world as 12 symmetrical columns, 12 columns of the same size. The ratio is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, right? 
But we don't have to do it that way. We can actually have columns, and Grid makes this incredibly easy, where the columns are based on a golden ratio, 1 to 1.6, or where one column is a fixed size in pixels, and another column is flexible and squishy, and another column is based on the size of the content that's inside the column. You can mix those things together in a way that's incredibly hard to do using any tool we have today. Maybe you can accomplish it with calc, but otherwise you're sort of stuck with only using percents or only using a certain technique. Um, in this case, you can mix and match. We're also used to, by using Bootstrap and the other sorts of frameworks, all of them all the way back to 960.js, we're used to thinking about the world where the content is the size of the cell, or it is the size of the track. The track is the content, the content is the track. But in Grid, it's really different, where the track is the size that it's being told to be, if you use that technique, and the content can fit inside of it. Or maybe the whole track is being sized by one piece of content, but there's other content also in the track that could be smaller. Also, all the content doesn't have to be up against the top right, the left corner. Like, it can be centered or it can be aligned to the bottom or to the left um, using the alignment property, which uh, uh, Rachel was talking about, or the alignment spe specification. We're, we know from Flexbox, justify content, align content, align self, and align items. But uh, there's two more being added that both go with grid. So we got justify content, align content, justify self, align self, justify items, align items. So if you want some homework from this, and you, we mean, please do try out Grid, but if nothing else, go play Flexbox Froggy and Flexbox Defense, because you're, it's gonna take a while to memorize what all those things are. It's kind of confusing, and like, wait, is it justify, just align items, self, what? Like, so we, nail it, just drill yourself. <laughs> um, it's a good skill to build up, because it's gonna come in handy. It means as well, though, that we can say that box, the big squarish gray box, is in, it's being placed into an area that's of four cells, and then it's being centered in those cells. Grid also means that we don't have to put things up against the top of the page. Floats, I think of floats like a bathtub full of bars of soap, where every bar of soap is floating up to the top of the page. And no matter what you do, you rearrange things at a break point, all the bars of soap just sort of rejuggle themselves. It's very hard to get things to push down. And because of that, we've had 20 years of web design where everything is sort of just shoved up against the top of the page. You don't have to do that with Grid. You can space things out by using rows. Grid has rows. There are many, many, many ways to use CSS Grid that are very different than the tools that we've been using. So not only do I encourage you to stop using those tools, and I encourage you to not be one of these people who goes, makes, goes and makes a new third-party framework that's better because it uses CSS Grid. Like, no, go make another game for learning alignment properties. <laughs> uh, don't make a framework. CSS Grid is a framework, as Rachel Andrew has said. It's, it is a framework in the browser. You don't need to build a framework on top of the framework. So I've been looking at a lot of books. Here's a, a poster that I saw, the one on the right. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, grid, white space. Could I build that? Yes. So that's a web page. Doesn't look like a web page. But that's a web page laid out using CSS grid. Very simple layout, actually. And the first thing I did when I did this layout is I figured out my content order. It's, most, it's important to figure out the order of the content first. What is the HTML? What is the order? If I had no CSS at all, the CSS fell off the page. And there are many reasons that it does. Screen readers is one of them. Using something like Instapaper or Pocket or Read It Later is another. If someday we wake up and Alexa and Cortana and Siri start reading web pages aloud to us, like the order of the HTML matters. It's also just a nice constraint. Put it in the correct order, and then you can go on with your life. You might see that like Jazz at Lincoln Center is the boat logo is first, and then the headline, the title of the website is second. I got this word schedule of events, which never shows up on the finished product. It only shows up in the HTML, and then it's displayed, it's, it's hidden. Then I did a float-based layout, kind of simple, maybe a little awkward. I could have spent more time on this if I wanted to, made it a little more polished. Or maybe this is appropriate, because it is about jazz, and that kind of like, whatever is very jazz-like, right? So why not go with that? And then I used uh, feature queries to target browsers that understand Grid and to give them this code, a little bit of undoing the previous styling and then applying the new styling. Overall, I feel like Grid, everything we've been doing so far with layout frameworks, you 
place items onto the grid. And you can do that with grid. You can place items onto the grid. And then you can use breakpoints and change the placement of those items onto the grid. The example I just showed you is done that way. You can also let grid place things for you. You can do no, you can say, say nothing about where you want things to go, and grid is going to start playing, lay, laying them out for you. And that might be great. You can also do a combination where some of the items you've told grid where to put it, and then it lays the rest of them out using the auto placement algorithm. And that is another thing that's hard and tricky to start to, like, really changes your thinking about how this stuff works. Here's an example that works. Uh, by using 100% auto placement. This is a very classic, a bunch of squares, right? This is a, a, a layout that we do all the time. It's, this particular one wouldn't be hard to do with floats. You could also do this with Flexbox. Um, this is the markup that I've got, so it's just a bunch of images in a row. There's my CSS. That's seven lines of CSS. That is all of the CSS for this entire example. That's not a little bit of it, that's all of it. And all of the layout CSS for that example is here. Two lines of code, display grid, grid template columns, repeat auto fit min max 280 to 1FR. It's complicated, I don't have time to explain it. It's, Rachel was talking a little bit about this as well. One line of code defines your grid, and all the items get placed automatically. Why would you need a framework for this? You just write this. It's pretty awesome, the auto placement algorithm. This is a lot like, uh, this drawing sort of illustrates the point that Rachel was making earlier, where some of the items, all of the items are getting placed automatically. Some of them I've told them to be bigger, and so it's leaving gaps. Or I can use grid auto flow dense, and it will take those items and rearrange them so that there are no gaps. It fills things back in. This design, um, Pete Mondrian, very famous. This whole art movement, this whole era, this time, this period of time was about experimenting and seeing what could be done with a fresh modern take on society and a fresh modern take on design, industrial design, graphic design. It was a reaction to the sort of embellishments of the Victorians and it was a, it was a way to artistically express what was happening in the industrial revolution, switching from an agricultural society to a very mechanic, mechanical society. And I feel like these paintings, you know, if you look at them with the sense of like, why is that important? I could have done that. It's like, well, yeah, you could paint that today because we're so used to this kind of thinking, but would you have painted this when everything around you was Victorian, when everything around you was this other style? Um, and I think some of what these paintings are about is really exploring what happens when you draw a bunch of boxes of different shapes and sizes on a grid. What happens when you put a bunch of color in them? What does that feel like? Where does your eye go first? What is that? Overall, what's the impression that that gives off? And those are the questions I think we need to be asking about the web at this moment. So I wanted to turn this into a web project, a website. And I spent quite a while figuring out, well, what's the HTML for this? At first I thought that those would all be color blocks and sort of background images. But then I realized, no, actually, if I do that, it's just, my HTML is a bunch of empty divs. That's not right, I don't want empty divs. So Really, I want my screen reader experience to be a poem that is a list of colors. That makes sense. So I took the, draw the painting and chopped it up into uh, each color block. I put a black border around each one. And then I, um, there you can see that, right? There's just a stack of images. Then I laid them out using CSS Grid. And then I made it uh, responsive. <laughs> And it's fascinating. I have another example that you can look at at labs.jensimus.com. A lot of those uh, paintings were done in a diamond shape to kind of explore what does a diamond do. So I use clip path to chop the thing into a diamond. You can start to see what happens as everything slides around behind the, clip, the clipped path of the diamond. What is it that's, what are you gonna get? What kind of impression will your site give if each one of those blocks was content? If each one of those was like another newspaper article or another part of the UI for your application or whatever, right? Here's an example, right? So just to get you an idea of Victorian, the look and feel from the Victorian era was stuff like this, right? In some ways I feel like the Victorians are a lot like the people who love bootstrap because everything <laughs> was folded in half like this symmetrical, everything's so symmetrical and everything all like, 
And then these movements came along. Uh, Bauhaus was one of them. There's a Bauhaus museum here in Germany, if you in Berlin, if you want to check it out. I'm totally going over there the next couple of days. Um, but there were things happening all over this part of Europe. Um, lots and lots of different people, some of which are, got more credit and fame than others, but there were quite a few. And they were doing things like this. What happens when you turn things on a diagonal? What happens if you use giant blocks of red? What happens if you use heavy lines and turn your words sideways? What kinds of feelings do you get? How does this contrast to what had come before? This one is my favorite. This is before um, photogravure came out, before offset printing got done, and before things were done using f film to prepare plates for press. This was done still in the era where everything was hand set, type, metal type, and all the lines and everything that you might get were m other pieces of metal. So this is, this is a person collecting a bunch of those pieces of metal and figuring out how to make an art project and like taking the thing that you can't really do much with and just turning it 45 degrees and blocking it in with wood and metal at 45 degrees, like really pushing the boundaries of what was possible given the technology that they had. Um, so I have this website, the lab's website. This is the top of the page now if you go to it in a normal people browser. Um, it looks like this. This is my fallback layout. This is my base experience like Jeremy talked about yesterday. You can read the text and it's typeset in Futura. Like there you go. I could do some more. I could, you know, put some borders and some colors on this, but I kind of like it very simple. And then if you go to it in a browser that has grid enabled or like Firefox Nightly, an experimental browser, you get this experience. It's using um, writing modes to turn the text and transform rotate to turn the entire block, which is really a good choice. Writing modes gets you a way to turn text much more easily than if you were using transform rotate to turn that text. Um, and so, and it's also totally responsive. Uh, why is my video not playing? Let's see if it plays. Anyway, you can look at it yourself. It, um, at smaller screen sizes, it's got straight again, and then it, the things rearrange themselves at different sizes in order to fit into the space that's available. Here we go. Um, yeah, you get the idea. So uh, when and where is this all available? It's, you know, it looks like it's sad and depressing and nobody has grid and uh, nobody's building grid, but that is not the truth. Everybody is working on the grid very, very, very hard right now. And I expect to have it come out in a pretty spectacular way and for, to catch the industry off guard. Because we're used to things coming out like gradients where it kept getting changed and it turned into a mess. Or Flexbox kept getting changed and it turned into a mess. Grid kept getting changed in secret. You just didn't know and it's all gonna be done and fully baked and when we pull the cake out of the oven, it's gonna work instead of it being kind of a crazy mess. Um, Firefox Nightly is one of my favorite ways to find out where, it's just a down, like you don't have to flip the flag, it's easy, just use it. Also, Nightly has this really awesome add-on that Potch and I made for you where you can um, use it to, you click the little button and then the, you can see the grids. It can be very hard to learn grid and understand what you're doing when you're not really sure, like things aren't where you thought they would be and you don't know if it's you or if it's the browser or like you don't know why it's broken. It's very, it helps a lot to be able to see the lines to figure out why it's broken. So check out that add-on. So how are we gonna use any of these technologies when IE still exists? Um, there's this idea that we have sometimes where things either work or they don't work and you can use them or they don't use, you can choose not to use them and so you get this matrix uh, and you want to use it because you want it to work but it doesn't work everywhere because IE. So then you use it and it doesn't work and you get fired or you get covered in bugs and that does, that's not good. So you just have to choose to never use any of these things but that's not good. The problem is not IE, the problem is this box. This is not the reality of what is going on. This is the reality of what's going on. You can use it and not use it at the same time. It works and it doesn't work at the same time. It's quantum CSS. <laughs> and this is where the unicorn kitten lives. The unicorn kitten lives in the use it and don't use it at the same time box. You don't have to decide to use it. Like you don't have to wait eight years. That's the nature of CSS. So, you know, hey, 5% of your people get the experience on the right. Nah, it's okay, they don't have viewport unit support. No big deal. Only 12% of the people see the drop cap. 88% of the people see the old. They don't know that they're missing something. It's fine. Uh, okay, 0% of people <laughs> get to see the grid layout. All right, maybe you don't ship this into production yet. Okay. 
uh, unless you're like me and, and you're showing other people like you. Um, but you know, as soon as, I don't know, 8% of browsers, 10%, 20% of browsers have grid, maybe that's the time to start shipping. Um, I have an entire talk that will show you step by step by step exactly how to accomplish this kind of CSS that works and doesn't work at the same time. I also have a talk that I gave last year where I show many more properties in CSS and the kinds of things that we're going to be able to do to really change our layouts. Um, and then this talk as well, this is a 25, 20, how many minutes version of this talk, but uh, there's a longer version that you can also watch online um, where I get into a little bit more of it all. Um, and again, check this out, labs.jensimmons.com. Um, I really do think that it's time for us to be experimenting. It's time for us to not only learn grid, and honestly, learning grid, you're not going to be able to learn grid over one weekend. Um, this is not border radius. Grid takes quite a while to learn. So if you started learning grid casually here and there now, you'll maybe understand it by February or March if it starts shipping in February and March. Like, it took me at least six months to get my head wrapped around it. Um, so why not start now and experiment and play around? You could prototype things. You're working on some sort of design or your, your designers are working on something. You can do some prototypes in Grid and then toss them and redo the thing and uh, other kinds of code later. Um, go to layout.land. I'm building a site there. Over the winter, I'll be building this site out where we'll be able to show each other experiments and share ideas and have challenges and challenge each other and play around. So um, sign up for an email list to get info when that launches and some other info as it comes out. So thank you very much.